Good morning, I'm MMAC President Tim Sheehy, and I wanna thank you for joining the weekly webcast on Tuesdays from 11 to 12. MMAC's mission is to develop Metro Milwaukee as a globally competitive location for businesses that deliver high value jobs to foster a vibrant quality of life for all. This program provides actionable insights to the challenges and opportunities we all face in developing the region as a better place to live, work, play, and learn. We'll start with an update on COVID-19, its impact, and steps to improve the region's health. Joining us to do that is Dr. John Raymond, president of the Medical College of Wisconsin. We'll then look ahead at the broader issue of rebuilding employee and consumer confidence through the lens of some of the hardest hit portions of our economy, leisure, travel, hospitality, entertainment, and dining. So in addition to Dr. Raymond, we're joined by Greg Marcus, president and CEO of the Marcus Corporation, and Paul Bartolotta, co-founder and owner of the Bartolotta Restaurants. This webcast is powered by Aurora WDC, a Madison-based market and intelligence firm to help us make faster and smarter decisions. Visit them at auroradwdc.com. The webcast is sponsored by ERC MedWest, providing decontamination and disinfection services. As businesses open and welcome employees and customers back, ERC President Mike Maltesta adds this note, thanks to the MMAC and its members for the work you've done, working your way through the unknowns of this pandemic and staying informed and keeping people upbeat and positive about the future of our businesses, our employees, their families, and our entire community. ERC Midwest has a COVID-19 disinfection certificate and discount for MMAC members with a guaranteed lowest price. Visit them at ercmidwest.com backslash MMAC. And if you've got questions during the program, please submit them and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. So let's start with an update on our COVID-19 status with Dr. Raymond. Dr. Raymond. Thanks, Tim. I'll just start by saying it's been a reasonably good week for us here in Wisconsin, and I'll try to summarize some of the data. Uh, with diagnostic testing now, we are over 400,000 tests administered in Wisconsin, and nearly 90,000 in Milwaukee. We've had almost 23,000 positive tests for a 5.4% positive rate cumulatively, but recently we've been well under that 5% mark, both here and in Milwaukee, which I think is good progress. We've had almost 10,000 positive tests in Milwaukee with a cumulative percentage of about 10.9%. And yesterday was a rather light day for reporting tests. We had a little over 6,000. And recall that we've been averaging somewhere between 10 and 11,000 tests per day. We'd really like to push that up close to our capacity, which has been stable over the last few days, but has grown by about 1,000 since last week. So we're approaching 17,000 tests per day capacity here. And there's 68 current laboratories that are testing with 25 planning to test. In terms of positive tests, we had 174 in Wisconsin. Again, a relatively light day compared to recent trends and a 2.8 positive uh, percentage yesterday. And only 77 reported positive tests in Milwaukee for a 3.5% seven-day average. And I use the seven-day average because of reporting lags in Milwaukee. If we go to the next slide, um, I can summarize the hospital metrics by saying we're in really good shape. Our number of cumulative hospitalizations is over 3,000 with a 13.3% likelihood of being hospitalized if you have a positive test, but that rate is going down and that's important. We also had our lowest census yesterday of 284 since early April. And again, that's reflective of a trend of slowly decreasing hospitalization numbers over the last two weeks. We only had 100 in the ICUs, which also was, was very good. And our ICU and ventilator capacity remained uh, copious and adequate. PPE trends uh, slightly improved, but the most critical needs remain goggles, gowns, and N95 masks. Next slide, please. Now we're approaching 700 cumulative deaths in Wisconsin, which obviously is terrible. On the other hand, we are doing better than most of the states surrounding us and 318 of those deaths occurred in Milwaukee. There's still a predominance of Black and African-American deaths compared to the population prevalence. 
uh, but the majority of the deaths now, both in Wisconsin and in Milwaukee, are actually in white or Caucasian individuals. We're starting to see an uptick in the percentage of deaths attributed to people of Hispanic or Latin heritage, uh, both here in Milwaukee and in Wisconsin. Now, in terms of some good news, the doubling time for positive tests continues to increase now to 27 days in Wisconsin and 29.4 days in Milwaukee. And the daily growth rate of positive tests also is fairly low at 1.2% in Wisconsin and 1.1% in Milwaukee. But remember that our numerator has grown. So even though the doubling time uh, has extended out and the percentage of positive tests uh, is low, we're still basing that on a growing number. And then also in really good news, the reproductive number for Wisconsin was 0.87 and for Milwaukee was 0.73. And it's worth noting that the uh, reproductive number, both in Wisconsin and Milwaukee, has been under one for 13 consecutive days. Again, with the theme of pretty good news, actually. Next slide, please. This next slide shows those reproductive number trends in Milwaukee County, shown in tan, and Wisconsin, shown in blue since the beginning of the pandemic. And I'd like to call your attention to the right side of the graph, where both lines are below 1.0 is shown by dipping below the dotted red line. And again, the longest stretch of days during which the R was less than one for Milwaukee and Wisconsin has been the last 13 days. Next slide, please. Now this slide shows the trajectory of COVID-19 by plotting the new cases in the last seven days on the vertical axis versus the cumulative cases since the beginning of the pandemic on the horizontal axis using a logarithmic scale. And we've shown this slide before to demonstrate that the trajectory of the pandemic here in Wisconsin and Milwaukee really weren't dipping downward. On the other hand, I think what you see here is that Milwaukee shown in pink and Wisconsin shown in teal show a clear deceleration of the trajectory of the pandemic. And this trend is more pronounced in Milwaukee than it is in Wisconsin. We'd love to see that trend continue for the next few weeks. Next slide, please. Now, this next slide, again, shows similar data. This is from CNN.com, and it shows a map of the United States, color-coding states based on whether they're showing increases or decreases from the previous week in the number of COVID-19 tests. And you can see here that Wisconsin, shown in light green, was one of 20 states that had a clear week-over-week -week decrease in COVID-19 tests cases. Next slide, please. And this is the last slide I'm going to talk about. It summarizes advances in our knowledge about COVID-19 since our last webinar on June 9th. Now, just to summarize, some states still are trending upward for COVID-19 positive tests, and many of those are in the South and the Southwest, and quite a number of those states were states that opened up earlier than we did. There are multiple studies that have been published over the last week that have confirmed the effectiveness of face coverings and social distancing. And these remain our two best tools for combating the pandemic. Now those studies are summarized for you in information and for your reference on the next six slides, but I'm not gonna review those today. They're really there for your reference. COVID-19 antibodies have been shown to persist now for at least two months after infection, and that's potential good news for the effectiveness of the vaccine, at least for a season. And it is important to note that up to one in 12 people who've been infected with COVID-19 don't develop detectable antibodies. Now, that doesn't mean they may not have some form of immunity, but it also tells us that even if antibodies confer immunity, not everybody's gonna have those antibodies, even if they've been confirmed to have an infection. We also now know that multiple COVID-19 vaccines are moving into phase two and phase three clinical trials. And also that multiple governments are investing in manufacturing COVID-19 vaccines on the hopes that those respective clinical trials will have positive results. So I'd like to point out that that's never been done before. The example here in the US is called Operation Warp Speed. Now, not shown here, but in late breaking news release just a few hours ago is a promising high quality study from England showing that the steroid dexamethasone reduces mortality in critically ill COVID-19 patients by 35% for patients on ventilators and by 20% for patients who require supplemental oxygen but who are not on ventilators. And it's important to note that dexamethasone is a widely used immunosuppressive and anti-inflammatory drug 
which is inexpensive and readily available and can be used both in oral and IV form. So this is potentially good news on the treatment front. And with that, I'd like to say thank you and turn it back over to Tim. Thanks very much, Dr. Raymond. So um, really good news, especially on, uh, I think, the lowest level of hospitalizations you noted uh, going back to early April. Uh, a question for you as you turn to other states around the U.S. that are seeing an uptick, um, what kind of concerns does that cause you? Well, again, we've always said that um, COVID-19 doesn't respect county lines or um, state borders, and it's something that we really need to look carefully at. And there's some new evidence that COVID-19 is spreading from community to community by using U.S. interstates. So as we see travel from Chicago and Iowa up to the north woods of Wisconsin, those are trends that we're going to have to pay attention to very carefully. And then the other thing is we kind of look even further and we see the increase in South America and other countries, um, and not just from an economic perspective in terms of their own economies, but the global economy. How do you assess what's happening in other parts of the world uh, that are maybe further behind on the curve than we have been in the United States and Europe? Yeah, thanks, Tim. And we've talked about this a few times in the past. I think there are a couple of points that are worth observing. First of all, um, even in the warm weather of the Southern Hemisphere that we've seen over the last few months, there's been a pretty significant spread of COVID-19. So we probably can't completely count on warm weather here to help us much in terms of eradicating that uh, pandemic. So we all need to continue to wear face coverings and to do social distancing. I also think that since you know we live in a world where it's easy to traverse the entire globe, that we need to be careful of those travel patterns and the possibility of boomerang waves back into the northern hemisphere. And you know I think uh, it bears watching what's happening in Beijing. Uh, China had no reported cases for a considerable period of time, and now they have um, several small outbreaks in Beijing that they're tracking very carefully. And then um, kind of as we look uh, forward a little bit, um, I've been seeing more stories and more projections about upticks in October and in the fall. So how do you look at Wisconsin based on where we are today and um, what observations do you have kind of looking out? And I realize it's a difficult thing to do for the fall here. Yeah, we really don't know what's going to happen in the fall, Tim. But what I would say is we're still on our first wave here in the U.S. And it may extend all the way out into the fall anyway. So continued vigilance is important for us. We never crushed the curve here, so to speak, early in the pandemic. And we're all learning to try to accommodate some low level of infection in our communities. And I don't think that it'll be completely eradicated by the fall. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Raymond. I know you'll stick Thanks. around for questions. Um, and um, we're now going to pivot a little bit. And I want to bring uh, Greg and Paul in for a discussion on uh, rebuilding employee and consumer confidence. Uh, both Greg and Paul are MMAC board members, and we've been sharing uh, periodically uh, with our board polling that we've done over the last several months. And uh, if you can skip ahead, yes, to the slides there. And I just want to share um, some of the polling as we start to set up a discussion about consumer and employee confidence. Um, and we've been polling regularly. This one, I think, was done in the last week in May. Um, and we can still see a very high number of people concerned about contracting COVID, COVID or somebody they know. Um, the concern about social distancing, whether it's being taken seriously enough, um, wearing masks in public, um, and whether they're concerned about the future. Uh, we can also see the rather stark differences by party uh, in terms of the reaction to um, safer at home and um, whether or not uh, wearing a mask is effective or whether they would wear one in public. Um, let me flip to the next slide, um, which talks about um, how comfortable people feel going out to grocery stop, shop, returning to work, eating out at a restaurant, going to a movie, flying, or to a large sporting event. Um, and clearly a lot of concern that still exists out there for both employees and consumers. So um, let me bring in uh, Greg and Paul and we'll engage in a little bit of a discussion, but for starters, just by way of introduction, Greg, can you share just with the audience the broad range of uh, hospitality businesses under the Marcus Corporation umbrella? 
Sure. Uh, thanks, Tim. Thanks for having us, and thanks for for this ongoing dialogue you guys have 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 led on at MMAC. I think it's been great. Um, you know, we are involved, obviously, and I think everything everything you listed. <laughs> we have we have hotels. You know, we we own eight hotels around the country. We run another eleven. Um, we have uh, ho we have and inside our hotels we have restaurants. Uh, so we're dealing with restaurants. Um, in our, uh, it, we went, but the bigger part of our business is movie theaters, so so entertainment, and uh, and then actually privately we have some restaurants as well. Um, the Hospitality Democracy restaurants in the Third Ward uh, are ours. We have Verlo mattresses, so we actually have a retail uh, exposure as well. So uh, we're we're involved in in all the things that you're talking about. That have, and, and yes, you know, I mean, we've been extremely hard hit. We've been we've essentially been closed for the last quarter. Yeah, Greg, I think I remember the discussion you had early on with me when this pandemic first hit and you talked about the challenges of running a publicly traded company with little or no income coming in. Uh, yeah, uh, it's hard to believe that we went from, you know, $800 million a year in revenues to zero, uh, to at least, you know, right right now. But but we've got an eye towards reopening, and it, but it's going to be a long road. We've got a long road, the, the long, long haul to come back to. Yeah, and we'll come back and talk about that. Um, and, and Paul, can you share with the audience again, kind of what's under the Bartolotta group and how that looks? So we're exclusively in restaurant and food service. We have 17 different units. We have some uh, corporate executive dining uh, with Kohl's and a couple of uh, clients uh, as part of the U.S. Bank uh, complex. We have a few food halls. We have some airport restaurants. We have three restaurants at the airport. And then we have a series of upscale casual and then fine dining restaurants. I think we got a little glitch with Paul's internet connection. So hopefully that'll come back here. Greg, I'm gonna pivot back to you um, and just kind of ask you kind of a starter question here as you look across the breadth of your businesses in terms of what you see are the keys to listing to lifting consumer confidence you know uh it's it's going to be a combination of things you know first of all is really what is our approach going to be and how are we going to what are we going to do to to give a safe environment with a, with obviously i mean there's the obvious the the focus on clean, sanitation and cleanliness and and good hygiene um, you know, you'll see when you when you, when you go to when when you when you experience our restaurants, which Mason Street's open now, opened last week. Fister has been reopened. Um, the theaters are starting to reopen. They will be opening a few on Friday. I can get into a little more detail on that as to how that how that really works. It's a little bit different than the hotels, but you'll see just the visual. You know, the people cleaning more, the 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 hand sanitizer everywhere. The the there's. Um, you know, uh, either we have glass at the Fister or plexiglass in the different environments to to to, to separate the the workers from the from the from the customers. Um, you know, an emphasis on social distancing. You know, on the floors you'll see markers for six feet so that we keep people six feet apart. Uh, those are the visual cues that you'll see. Um, you know, it, it, you should, but and, and an overall uh, an approach thing. How do we have a low to no contact environment? You know. And that may sound odd, you know, especially the theaters. I mean, the people are like, how does that work in the theaters? But interestingly, it's a very, it's not, you know, people sort of lump theaters and they say, oh, that's like going to a concert or going to a baseball game or going to something else. But it's actually sort of different because, uh, first of all, we, you know, we've been had significant investments in technology over the last number of years. So, you know, you can buy your ticket online on your phone. You can actually buy all your concessions on your phone. So now you come to the theater, you you don't actually have to go to a box office. You don't have to go to uh, a concession stand. You just walk in, you go to a, a pickup point, your concessions are, are ready for you, you specify the time you want them ready, and the uh, and, and you and you say your, tell them your name and they point to your bag and you take your concessions in, you go sit down in a seat that's been cleaned and sanitized, and you all face one direction, you're not talking, you're not high-fiving, you're not singing, you're, 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 it's a relatively passive experience uh, in a movie theater, and because we have uh, recliner seating, you have seven feet of distance between rows, and we're going to set up the seating to, so that you're going to have two seats on and two seats off. And then in the row behind you, 
no one will be right behind you. That'll be the ne- those two seats will be empty, and then the ne- the two seats next to those will be filled. So you get a sort of checkerboard style. So we're going to be able to create that social distancing that Dr. Raymond said is very important, um, and that and have everybody you know and, and create that, that 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 level of comfort. And then it's going to be time. You know, it's people seeing that that it's that you as I you know that it's, that they, that people are going out and hearing that it's that it's that it's a comfortable experience, and and that will I, to your question of how do you get people feeling comfortable? I think hearing, oh yeah, I went to that restaurant and it was it felt good, it was comfortable. I went to that theater, it felt good, it was comfortable. I went to that hotel, you know. Um, we uh, th- that that's I think how we start to build that confidence and get people to come back. Paul, let me ask you a similar question about uh, how you're going about building consumer confidence. And then as we've talked a little bit about confidence in your employees. Well, the employee thing is a whole separate uh, issue um, because, you know, up until recently, you know, we know that they're going to get a stimulus package until the end of July. And so a lot of people are very concerned about coming back into the workplace let me think about this. I could make more money by being at home and I'm safe. Gee, do I really want to go back to work? So part of the issue is finding that balance, but really let you know, as our tenants always speak to, you know, our, our employees come first and our guests not come second. I'm picking up another glitch on Paul. Um, so as till he comes back on, Greg. Here I come, <laughs> back to the plate. <laughs> You're back up. So never leave the batter's box. Um, <laughs> l- 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 let me ask you the question about just where I was asking Paul about employees. Oh, oh there he is. Or you oh. see the more people are going to, you know, Costco and they're saying you have to wear a mask or you go into stores, the more and more that's happening, uh, the consumers are adapting to it. And being that I only need, you know, 50% of the customers that I'll, so I can handle anyway, there may be some people who aren't happy with that, but uh, it's a little bit like secondhand smoke. It wasn't set up, secondhand smoking wasn't set up for the smoker. It was set up for the other person who doesn't want to inhale that smoke. If I'm going to be respectful to win my customer back and say, hey, I really care about your safety, but it's okay to breathe on my employees, I'm not sending a consistent message to my employees. Highly topical. And when I saw your slide about being also a red or a blue or a blue or a red conversation, listen, I'm in the hospitality business. I'm Switzerland here, right? I need customers in the chairs. So the reality is for me, it's a health issue. It's not a political issue. It's a health issue. And I think it's really important that our employees know that. Now, listen, if everybody is boycotting and I can't see people, Um, One thing we've learned about this whole process is the best laid plans, you pivot, but uh, you know, you got to pivot every, every plan I've made has changed and morphed. And so, you know, the destinations, but the road may change a million times over. But for the moment, it went from, you can't do this, Paul, to, you know what? We actually really respect this. I haven't opened a restaurant yet. It's coming very soon. And then the proof will be in the pudding, so to speak. Paul, one, let me just ask you another question because you shared with me a very poignant story early on about uh, friends and relatives in Italy. Um, and it really set the tone, I thought, for how you addressed your business here in the US. So, so yeah, so um, friends of mine, I have friends, obviously my wife and daughter lived in Florence for the last five years. My daughter went to high school in Florence at an international school. And, and I was buying a lot of my fish for my restaurant in Las Vegas from vendors in Milan and near Milan. And one of my dear friends in Bergamo, one in Milan, another friend in Barcelona, um, were all telling me these apocalyptic stories. And he walked out to the garden, one of my guys, and said, what do you hear? And I'm like, birds chirping? He's like, no, listen. And I said, I hear sirens. He goes, yeah, dying or death. And I was like, seriously? And he goes, Paul. So I told him, you know, we're gonna do curbside and we're gonna make all these adjustments. And he's like, Paul, we said the same thing. Northern Italy is a very sophisticated medical system and complex and and they make Ferrari and and you know so it, this is not a third world country right and they were just descended upon like locusts and um the stories he told me about relatives literally passing away or going to the hospital in wartime and saying you're too old go home 
where they were selecting and then people passing away in their relatives home and waiting three days for the coroners to pick up your your loved ones you know i, I don't want to get crazy but it really hit me because these were dear friends of mine and they were both sick as well. And so to me, I just said, we, we do not need to underestimate this. What is our problem, was I said, and our problem is a virus. And how do we, as a community at large, offensively shut it down? And so for me, I listened to Dr. Raymond, I listened to uh, Dr. Cassidy, I listened to the other physicians and they say masks. It's the choice is zero or potentially 60%. I used to live in Vegas. I'll take the 60%, right, <laughs> as opposed to zero. So I just think that the more people we can get on board with this, the faster we put this to bed and the faster we won't be at 50%, we'll be back at 100%. The consumers want us back there, but we have to fight this virus. And any country that I've read about, and I'm just a cook here, but any, any restaurant that I've... Um, that I've read any country that I've heard that's really beaten this, they've beaten this by masks. Both sides of the table wearing masks, not to make a restaurant pun, everybody wearing masks. And so I could get shot down. I'm running a business. I have obligations, but for the moment, that's my position. And I'm going to try to really stick with it, not to be disrespectful to any of my customers. I want all of, and those on this call, I want you all in my restaurants, please, as does Greg. But this is the position I'm going to take. I'm Thank crazy. you, Paul. And, and, and Greg, kind of a similar question to you. I mean, again, I think one of the first calls I got from you was the reality of what you're going to have to do with your employees, uh, but an outreach to try to get them placed with other companies who might be hiring. So as you look to bring back your workforce, what's the message there and what are the issues you're running into? You know, it's I, the same thing that Paul talked about, you know, the... Um, yeah. The, the 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 that that type that that supplement is really creates an issue for people, um, and yet balanced against that, you know, uh, is this idea that people do want to come back to work. Uh, we it was very it, we we've seen a, a mix. There are some people who say, you know, what I want to I, I like being at home and not and living uh, living this, but but there's others who say, you know what, I might actually get a little bit more, a little less money right this minute, but I want to be on a team. I want to make sure I have a job because this isn't going to go on. You know, forever. This is this is going to change at some point. I don't know how long. Maybe they'll extend it. They may change it to. I've heard a few different game plans around it. At least at least not make more money being at home than being at work. Um, that would be helpful. The uh, you know I, I we're, we are we are but, but so we we've tried to stay in contact with everybody. We did a lot of things along the way to try to maintain the the culture and the camaraderie. We have a thing called Marcus Cares that we put together. Um, and we, that, that's, a, that's a website that was a resource that was pointing people to other jobs if they needed them. And we have lost some people to other jobs. That, that has happened. Um, but, the, uh, but, but we've also, and has, we have a private Facebook group that people comment on and put pictures up and people can't, can't wait to get back. We have a thousand people in our, in our private Facebook group. So uh, it's been about me trying to maintain that culture, but it's gonna be a challenge. Now, again, we're gonna start off we're not going to be running at the same levels that we were running at, so we're not going to need as many people as we had at to, to when when things shut down. So it's going to be a mixture of managing our labor as tightly as we can manage it to the revenues that we have coming in the door and getting the right people there. Let me ask you both a question of, of looking at the hospitality, entertainment, travel business, and as you reflect on it, what are the unique challenges and opportunities for Milwaukee as you look ahead? Greg, you want to start? Okay. <laughs> you want me to go first? Um, look, you know, man, it's th this. This was the summer. I mean, oh my gosh, we were going to be we we had, we were predicting off the charts. I mean, it was just going to be it was going to be so good. Hard to replicate from from where that is. You know, um, I've been thinking about what is all that's going on mean to Milwaukee. Uh, you know, it's it's the lack of revenues. You know, it becomes a little bit of a of a vicious cycle because you know you need to market ourselves and without revenues coming in the door you know we can't you know we're, we're our, our room taxes are down that's going to impact visit how do we make sure that we still market our community because visit you know i mean that, that's our marketing arm you, yep. you don't you, you know you don't you, the car doesn't go anywhere if you don't put gas in and so uh you get you have to you know my grandfather used to have a joke and he said you know if i had a stack of five dollar bills to give away and i 
had them in my hand and I walked around all day and I didn't tell anybody that I had a stack of $5 bills to give away, what would I have at the end of the day? A stack of $5 bills, you know, because you have, the point being, you have to market your business. We have to, we have to market Milwaukee. So we'll be challenged there, you know, um, but on the other side, we have advantages. You know, we are not these, you know, you think about what's going on in New York and these very tightly packed gateway cities. You know, we have a little more space. You know, we have, we, we, I think we're, we, right now, we should be marketing. The only business that's coming in right now is leisure. There's no, there's no group business. There's no business travel right this minute. We should be an attractive place for people to come that, that want to experience our lakefront, experience our restaurants that are open now, experience our community. You know, go right after Chicago and say, get out of that, get out of that real tight area and come up and experience Milwaukee. And even more long term, you know, they talk about how in San Francisco, what Facebook is saying, half their people are going to work remotely. Now, maybe that, if that's a real macroeconomic trend, I don't know if it is. But if it is, well, you know what? Come live in Milwaukee because the cost of living is a lot lower. The quality of life is wonderful here. And so there could be some macroeconomic trends that are in our favor. Paul? Yeah, I, I echo what he's saying. You know, um, it's unfortunate you couldn't have not, you know, you couldn't have really even in a horror film, you could have predicted this dramatic of a shift um, between the optimism we had to the literally like respirator that we're on now in, our, in the hospitality industry and talking with a lot of other restaurateurs in town, um, particularly those in the downtown area, um, we really need to try to get to a level of safety where those restaurants can go from 25 to 50 and 50 to 75 as quickly as possible because we need the vibrancy of the restaurant scene in downtown Milwaukee. Our lakefront is our most valuable asset, so finding a way to continue to, to promote that. And again, you know, visit is such an important part of, of our ability to be out and about, not, not nationally, but even internationally. Um, so yeah, I, I think that he's right. We need to draw as many people here as, as much. We also have the advantage though, where a city like in my experience in Las Vegas and New York and Chicago, imagine being in Italy where the, the economy is built on tourism or New York, what their economy is like without tourism. So it's a big part of our world, but it's not all of our world. And um, you know, Marcus has been very ingrained in our community. So he will always have that. They will always have this support. We've tried hard to do the same. So we need to reconnect to our immediate community first and foremost and get them re-engaged. And I think that will then create the vibrancy to then, as he said, drive whatever revenues we can to start putting back out and communicating. It's a sad scenario. But again, I also believe that the community is gonna gonna rise to it. I, I I believe strongly in that. Let me ask you both, and I'll start with you, Greg, and then and then Paul. And you touched on this a little bit, but tell us right now kind of where you stand in your opening plans. And Greg, that would be for here and probably from other states. Um, so where do you stand right now? What do you see happening over the next couple of months? I'm gonna ask Paul the same question. Sure. Look on the hotel side, listen the hotel side. And they, and they both are a little bit different. We're, we are we opened the Fister last week, uh, Monday. You know, the, and our hotels are essential. We can open the hotels, but there really has been no demand at, at our. You know, you want to pick the toughest hotel. It's like to being in the hotel business is the toughest business. Being in the hotel, the business group based hotel is the hardest part of the hotel business. So we opened the Fister, and we're starting there and trying to see what kind of you know if, if we open it, who's going to show up. And how do we get the word out to, to get there? Because it's gonna it's gonna have to be a really pretty much a leisure customer for right now. Um, and we opened Grand Geneva uh, yesterday. Grand Geneva benefits from a, being a drive to again the drive to markets are much gonna have a better shot. And look again, nothing's gonna be out crazy out the door. But you know, Lake Geneva is a big. Ever, so many people want to get out of Chicago. And frankly, if you're on the west side of Milwaukee, if you want to get away, it's a great, you know, it's a 45 minute to an hour drive to Milwaukee. It's an hour, hour and a half from Chicago. And so that's probably our most, you know, that, that's got the most promise right now. We'll see about how the Fister does before we think about the St. Kate or the Hilton and getting those hotels open. And then we're also now going into other markets and, you know, in Oklahoma City, we have the, the Skirvin. Uh, we'll we'll open that. I think you know we're working up in that relatively soon. And then when we're looking at Madison, and sort of it's sort of it's a little bit of a we we our math right now is are we better off when we lose less open or closed? And our goal is to be open and how to lose less being open and really just get to the other side. That's the goal. Is just eventually this is going to turn around. I do believe people want to be together. 
human this human nature i think i mean it's great that we can do this you know it's not zoom go to meeting but a zoom I, lack of a you know, kleenex of go to of, of video, video meetings the zoom i don't think people want to exist this way people want to get together um they uh they the that's that is a that's a natural human tendency and i think we'll get back to that but we have to just sort of exist until we can get to there and that will come with effective treatments and vaccines and when those are in place then we'll all be in a, a better place it, it, it is an amazing anecdotally and i think i may have shared this with you tim you know i went to the to blue at the top of the fister the like the week before, right as they were shutting everything down and i bet we had a meeting up there in 20 in our, in our meeting room up there and we just walked to see what was going on in blue. And I'm thinking there's going to be nobody there. And it's very busy. And I'm thinking, what? Who's out? You know, but yet people just wanted to be out. And the same thing happened in theaters. This all transition to what we're doing with theaters. The Tuesday we closed, uh, like it must have been the 9th of March, maybe the 9th or 10th, maybe the 10th. Um, we, uh, we, we, we had a you know, $5 Tuesday. We used to sell about 150 to 200,000 tickets on a Tuesday. We'd sold 20,000 tickets and we're about to close. I mean, I, 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 who, who are all the people want to be together? And, that, and that's the good thing in the long run. There's going to be a hotel business. There's going to be a movie theater business. There's going to be a restaurant business. We all have to just get there and make sure we get to the other side. On the movies, okay, we are, we, we basically are, we, we doesn't, the movies don't work without big national releases. And you can't have a big national release and even an international release unless theaters are open across the world. So we need theaters to be open in LA and New York and uh, San Francisco and in China and everywhere for the studios to want to release movies. They, they had planned to release, the first big release was a movie called Tenant, July 17th. So even if we want to be open, you know, and we're going to open five, six theaters on Friday. Now we're opening those not to to because we think we're gonna do a lot of business. We're opening to test our protocols because we've all these great ideas about the low to no contact and what does the customer want and how does the customer feel about all the different things we're asking them to do. And you know, will they wear masks or encouraging them to wear masks? You know, what what can we, you know, will they be comfortable in the seats? How will the food work? You know, we're getting a little test of it with these with these drive-ins. We're seeing how the food works a little bit, but but this will be a better test. Um but we really can't open the whole circuit until the national movies are being released. They moved Tenant to the 31st of July. Uh, Mulan is now the 24th. So as, as they move the openings of the national of the national uh, movies, we are, and they're, again, they're doing that based on capacities around the country, who's open. As they start to move those, then we have to shift. And we're gonna do a phased reopening because to your earlier question of getting people back, you know, we can't just flick the switch and have everybody show up and start opening these things up. We've gotta get them back, train them in the protocols. You know, replace them if they're not coming back. Now, look, let's face it, like in the theaters, so many of our kids are young and we, we replace lots of people every year because they, they go off to school, they go off to college, uh, you know, they just do different things. So we're used to that, um, but it just takes some time. So we'll phase, we'll have a phase reopening in July as we get to whatever those movies or those national releases are going to be. And so, and we hope to be open, you know, middle of July with the whole circuit, and that, that's as long as these release dates hold. If they move them, we'll move them. Okay. And and Paul, how how are you looking at at opening tactically? So obviously, various municipalities have different uh, rules and different regulations and guidelines. Um, so our first restaurant will be Restaurante. I'm sitting in it right now. We've been working getting it ready. Um, it's a, one of our smaller restaurants. It's where the whole company began, so it seemed like us the right story to tell to reopen our. So our first one is we're back and we're here. Um, so that's one thing. We have a couple of new surprises. I don't want to jump ahead of my communications team in terms of a date, and but but we're talking days and weeks, not months. So you know, shortly um, we had we had hoped we thought uh, Cole's private campus uh, and downtown kitchen, but the U.S. Bank building. It has relatively low occupancy from you know what we're being told at this point. So a lot of the buildings in downtown don't seem like they have a lot of occupancy. So we're going to wait on that. That's what we thought would be the safest behind glass, you know, more of a food hall environment. Uh, but then we pivoted more to the outdoor dining. So Mr. B's out in Brookfield has a beautiful patio. Harbor House, of course, although we have a little bit of restriction on the seating capacity, would be very top of mind because it has a gorgeous patio views of the Calatrava, lots of fresh air, and a very spacious dining room that allows us with good distancing also to, to seat enough people to make a go of it. 
you know, when we look about reopening, we're not looking at, gee, how do we make a ton of money? How do we get to a point where we're, we're in the black? You know, this is not, oh, how much money can you make? It's like just not opening and running in the red. Because quite honestly, full disclosure, we just simply don't have the reserves to open and close. So I've been very patient. But what weighs on my mind is also the fact that my employees at the end of July are going to really feel this crunch. And, and so I've been sort of like juggling these two realities. Um, it's, it's becoming go time. Uh, Dr. Raymond's report was encouraging. Um, and I feel way better than I did even four weeks ago. So I think we're on the right road. I just think I would like for more people to realize that our, our problem is a virus and nothing else. It's not our economy. We have the greatest economy in the world. It will be back. We have the most innovative business people to figure it out. We have consumers who love to consume. We're ready to let them consume again. So, but what we need to do is make sure we don't get another spike because I can only speak for myself. Honestly. Hello. Thank you for coming back. So we're looking for the investors. So I know they're Sorry. about to start. So it's just one person. So sometimes they're running late, but. No, no problem. Uh, so for me, Ristorante will be approximate, um, depending on what the city does, they'll announce again on Thursday, we'll get an update from them. Um, certainly, Mr. B's in Brookfield and Mequon, the outer areas seem to be busier. Joey's out in, uh, out in Greendale is on the horizon. But <clears throat> I've created a template with an advanced team to go restaurant to restaurant to restaurant, one a week. And, and open them as quickly as we can. But we've also done something unique, which is we're running a, an active, uh, a, literally a daily reverse budgeting program where we're obviously running a daily P&L instead of waiting to end the month and going, how do we do? You know, we're doing a daily P&L every day where we've got a, a program that we're implementing the information so we can see within a point or two exactly how we're operating in terms of our cash flow, because it's really, it's really that. And then we have positioned our team to say, once we closed, it was like reorganize and figure out our finances. Then it became, how do we reinvent ourselves and how do we think? So one of the things we want to do is I have nostalgia from being in Italy every summer, right? This was, you know, we're coming up on vacation time. I deserve a week somewhere along here, right? And for me, my wife and daughter was like, too bad we can't go to Italy. And it really prompted me to think about, well, Ristorante, I have nostalgia of Tuscany, I'm gonna take you to Tuscany, right? And a couple of weeks from now, I'm gonna take you to Liguria. So I wanna take people on the journey. At Lake Park, I'm gonna take you to France. At Harbor House, I'm gonna take you to Nantucket. We started thinking about what we're gonna to do to reinvent the, the greatest hits and the standard items, but we're capable of more. So we are pushing ourselves to reinvent and rethink what we're cooking and creating an experience because people can't travel. So it's our job to create excitement. And we've spent time thinking, how do we reinvent ourselves? So that's one of our thought process. So hopefully I have a lot of good listeners excited to come back and eat in our restaurants at some point. And, uh, and uh, you know, Mason Street Grill has to jump ahead of us, but we're, we're, we're not too far behind. Thanks, Paul. Like, I'm You're ready to come me. to your place, Paul. It sounds really good. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting me excited. So, Chris, let's uh, let's bring Dr. Raymond back in. Let, let's uh, go to questions. Yeah, uh, we had uh, several several audience members praise both Paul, Greg, and Dr. Raymond for the optimistic and realistic tone mix they've had here. How how do you all three of you remain optimistic at a very difficult time? Well, I'll I'll start. Greg already said we live in a great city. So we've got a lot to be grateful for. And with leaders like Greg and Paul, I think we were showing modeling a responsibility in terms of uh, corporate citizenship. And I, I think um, we've done pretty well as a state, actually. Again, I'm gonna go back to thanking um, Mayor Barrett uh, for his early intervention and Governor Evers for the Safer at Home. I think it really helped, at least in terms of raising awareness of what we have control over. You know, for me, the the, the 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 saving grace is that I have great people that surround me. I mean, that's that's what's that's that's how we're going to get through this is the great team. 
that I have. And that's how I have confidence that we're going to get through it. And that's how I get by every day because that, that is, that's what's, that's, and it's not just even, not even internal. We've got great leadership in our community. As I said, Tim and Dr. Raymond, you've been, you guys have been fantastic. I'm going to, and Paul, and I, and I'm going to echo the whole thing about wearing a mask. I mean, it does all the research seems to point that way. It shouldn't be a political thing. And it's not about you getting it or you, you know, it's, it's about, it's about, I respect you and you respect me. And, and I, and, it's, is it fun to wear a mask? No, I don't, I don't care to wear a mask. But on the other hand, it's the right thing to do. And the research points that way. And I, I know it doesn't, it's not hurting to wear one, I don't think. Um, so, so I echo those comments. And we really, I'm glad that we're all trying to encourage people to do that and to not make it political and just do the right thing so that we can, so that we can get our economy back on track. And get ourselves in the play until it's not a permanent thing. When once once they get the treatments and the and the and the vaccines that work, we'll be beyond it. The world will get back to what I think would would be a normal thing. So that's so so from my perspective, um, I grew up in a family where it was really all about family. And um, as Greg said, you know, listen, you know, and Dr. Raymond, your team as well, and Tim, your organization, listen. Um, it's really about the people that you that you want to see every day. You come into work. You don't want to work with people you don't want to work with. You want to be around people that share your values, that share your passion, that share your work ethic. Um, and to my brother's credit, in his memory, uh, what an amazing guy! What he, what a thing he really built here, living it every day. I had a little something to do with it, but but clearly, um, we have an incredible group of people. And the fact is, is um, how do you stay optimistic? Well, your choice is optimism or pessimism. So at the end of the day, I'm all about optimism. If that's my choice, um, it's really a non-choice. So um, I'm a dreamer. My dad told me early on, um, he said, true artistic freedom is born out of economic freedom. Um, and I used to joke around, you know, uh, you know, Michelangelo needed the, the Pope to be able to paint the Sistine Chapel or places like this. Um, I have learned to make business decisions that I think are sometimes very difficult right now in order to feed my heart, which is hospitality and creativity and the fun of, of the restaurant business. So I need to make good business decisions today that allows me the freedom to go play. And hopefully I can share my play, our team's excitement for, for, for hospitality and reinventing ourselves with our guests. Um, and, and uh, the, 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 my father used to say, you know, you can have Pavarotti and have enough money to buy out the entire theater and sit there as a sole person if you have enough money to listen to Pavarotti. But Pavarotti is nothing with an empty theater. Pavarotti is great when he can feed off of that audience. And for us in the restaurant business, we need the seats filled. You know, we need rooms. We need hotel rooms filled. We need movie theaters film, you know, fi filled. You know, and we don't need hospitals filled. With all due respect, Doctor. Chris, Greg, thank you, Greg. We had a couple of very nuts and bolts questions about the movie industry. How does a ventilation system work in a movie theater? How does a ventilation system work? Um, oh man, I'm not an engineer. <laughs> I, I'll do. I do. I can tell you this though. We've given thought to the ventilation and the idea of bringing in more fresh air. And so one of the things you know, and we searched. We, we did a lot of research in motion. We put the HEPA filter into our ventilation system and would that catch this? And, and we were told that really the, the, the filtration was probably not gonna solve our problem. But what they did encourage us to do uh, was to get more fresh air into the system. And so we've increased our fresh air, but I think 20 to 30% coming in through the ventilation system. It's gonna impact the theater from the standpoint of, you know, in the summertime, now you're bringing in more hot air. If it's really hot out, a little more humid, it may be a little less comfortable uh, but it should, it'll still be fine for be, for being in and 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 and, a, and a, what we hope is a as a healthier environment. Greg, another question is: Do you think the drive-in movie resurgence is something that might stick with us even after we get back to normal? Do people enjoy that? Uh, you know, I we've talked about. I think we'll still keep them. We'll keep ours going uh, on the on on the others. I think they're a bit of a novelty. Um, again, I think that that uh if someone's more comfortable going to a drive-in we still want to have it i said well what are we going to do if on one of our theaters like on a, we actually hung it off the front of the theater and like now they pull up to see the movie and that actual movie is playing <laughs> and they see the end and that's not gonna be cool you know so 
but 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 we but we will figure out how to do how to do that. And I but but again, you know, I went and did it. And was it fun? Did my kids like it? They enjoyed it. Sure. But you can only do it in the summertime. The sound is certainly not as good, even though because it's coming over your radio. But it's good. It's fun. And it is, it's a fun experience right now. And it's a good a good re replacement for a little while. But I think in the end, the idea of going and sitting in a recliner and having a great pizza uh, or having some great popcorn is uh, is probably uh, probably tough to beat. I, if I may comment, I thought it was a brilliant pivot in given the times it just shows ingenuity and creativity. And um, I just, I thought it was just super smart. Thank you. I mean, what we're trying to do is stay top of mind. So, you know, you can order, you can order popcorn online and go pick it up. You can order Zephyros at the Ridge and at the North Shore and go pick up pizza for dinner every night. You know, you can have it. It's just wonderful. Um, you know, the drive-ins, they're not economically going to, you know, they're not, they're not a big economic driver, but it's about just staying in everybody's in their forefront of their mind. Dr. Raymond, uh, we had a question about why the reproductive number has fallen before, below 1.0. Is it masks and social distancing or are there other factors at play, maybe being outside more? Yeah, I really don't have a good answer for that. It's probably a combination of all of those things. Another question for you. Are there CDC or World Health Organization guidelines on an employee who travels for uh, leisure and comes back? Should they quarantine for a certain amount of time? Are there guidelines for that? Yeah, the guidelines are, are frequently updated and maybe my information may be a few days out of date, but I believe travel, you're supposed to quarantine for three days if you went into an area that's a hot spot. Um, if you haven't been exposed to somebody who is COVID-19 positive that you're aware of, I don't think there's any specific recommendation for further quarantining. Chris, let me jump in here and ask uh, uh, Paul and Greg and, and, and Dr. Raymond um, about your organizations and how you look at the, um, uh, the, the uh, racial inequity um, and some of the demonstra demonstrations in Milwaukee and, and how you look at that through the lens of three important institutions in this community, both from your own organizations and then from Milwaukee's perspective. Maybe I'll start with you, Dr. Raymond. Yeah, it, obviously lot, lots of work that we need to do here in our community. Um, you know, MCW and the Greater Milwaukee Foundation made a commitment several years ago after at Sherman Park, we had a dialogue with communities about how we could we could be better partners and better corporate citizens of the community. And so we made a commitment to have a physical presence and to be allies uh, with Central City Milwaukee neighborhoods. And I think what we're seeing now just highlights the importance of all, all the organizations in our community, especially those that are led by uh, by white men uh, to really dig deep and listen and try to change the organization. And for us, we're just beginning a process internally of looking at our hiring practices, our supply chain and what we're doing there, um, how we can be more intentional about this partnership with Greater Milwaukee Foundation and some of the neighborhoods in Central City, Milwaukee. Uh, but we know these problems have been with us for centuries and that there's no quick fix, but I think uh, we should all really work hard to, to recommit ourselves to listening. Greg? I, you know, it's hard to top that answer. I mean, Dr. Raymond's exactly right. Um, you know, and Tim, you and I have had these dialogues for a long time. I mean, I this has been our community, it's been our community and obviously not just our community, but I've, as I think about our community, our community's Achilles heel for, for a very long time. And I wish I could tell you that I was, that I've been surprised, but I'm not because it's we've been seeing this. And it, I mean, it, if I, I encourage anyone who hasn't just taken the time to drive up Fond du Lac Avenue and see what's going on and see that there's no jobs. And, that, and so we and, and, that, and, that, and we know the challenges of our education system and we know that our policing needs to be rethought. How what, what is our approach to, to how we're dealing with that? Um, you know, a, a mother shouldn't have to worry about their children. You know that, that that doesn't make sense. Um, and you know, just just being pulled over or, or having that that that's that's we've got to make changes as a community, and we've got it. We and it start. It's we've got to fix our education system. This is not fair. And generations are being impacted by this. We know the marker of success is education. You know, and so I've been telling our people 
Now, what are we going to do? Because a lot of well-meaning people have been trying to do things for a long time. We have to ask ourselves, what are we going to do differently? We have to look at this differently because you know the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again. And so we have to look and say, you know, okay, well, what can we do differently about education? What, how can we make that better? How can we deal with the mass incarceration? What, how, and, and how can we deal with all these underlying issues? And what is the root cause analysis of what's going on? In addition to the, to the policing issues, not just the policing issue. And, and, and I've asked myself as a company, you know, and we've been very, tried to be a, a good community citizen for a long time, and yet I know things we can do better. And so we're gonna ask ourselves, what can we do better? And what can we, how do we improve the situation? Um, Thank you, and, Paul. And that's what we have to do. So, so as an organization, we've had these five tenants, take care of our employees, take care of our guests, take care of our stakeholders, vendors, and people that we interact with, take care of our community, and then take care of the bottom line. Um, those are our, the word care kind of runs through everything that we do. Care a lot is, is our philanthropic uh, initiative. And it's about one fifth of our, our focus as an organization. And it's something that um, at this moment in time, uh, based on where we're at today at this moment, we talked about having to suspend a lot of our things because we simply don't have the financial resources. But what we challenged ourselves with is, okay, it's not only about writing a check or underwriting an event or giving a discount to a nonprofit. What can we do that is actionable with our group? So part of the thing that we've done is I've challenged my leadership team to come back even as short as this week with a list of, of new initiatives. So we've supported Safe and Sound and done their gala. We have a gala lotta that is a huge that we find one of these programs instead of giving a little bit to a lot, doing some significant contributions to really launch one of the organizations. But that simply isn't good enough anymore. So I would echo what, what Greg said, which is we cannot let this moment pass and we will not solve the problem by doing what we've done because obviously what we've done with all the best intentions simply was not good enough and i will tell you tim that i was profoundly moved when i came to the fire server arena i believe it was in december um and you did that entire presentation where you brought up race but it was like social injustice across the board or even the fact that we don't have enough women in high pl so the levels of this are massive and so we just need to, to stay focused on improving overall i don't have all the answers I, I i'm not sure who does but i will tell you that we are fully committed to rethink how we're going to work as an organization to do even more and when we get back on our feet we will recommit to this community because we will live and, and grow and thrive as a community or not at all. And your conversations about inner city education, it's just, you, you showed it in one of your early board meetings, once, that, once the school ended, these kids just, no more education. I mean, that simply doesn't work. So, so let me just wrap up quickly by asking the three of you one final question with a short answer, kind of looking back to look forward uh, what's one piece of advice that you would pass on uh, having gone through the challenge of the COVID crisis and the economic downturn? Um, and Dr. Raymond, I'll start with you and then Greg and wrap up with Paul. Yeah, I'm going to go back to a, a theme that came up earlier in the question. Let's, let's be optimistic and work together. Great. Greg? Yep. I mean, we, we have no choice. <laughs> be optimistic. Work, work with your team and, and, and rely on your team. Surround yourself with really good people. Thank you. Paul? We have an acronym that a friend of mine from a foreign country told me his English isn't particularly good. He says, Paul, you need to be fat. And I said, I resemble that. And he said, flexible, adaptable, and teachable. You need to be fat. And so if anything I've learned is you have to believe strongly in your views, but you got to be flexible and know when to pivot and when to try something new and measure it. And because you just... This is so fluid. You just got to be, you just got to be flexible. So I don't think I'm, I've, yeah, I don't think I've ever ended a webinar with the message, let's get fat, but uh, <laughs> let's take that in as a finish. And again, Dr. Raymond, thank you for joining us, Greg and Paul really appreciate your insights and advice. Uh, and we'll be back uh, next Tuesday uh, with another edition. Um, and so have a safe rest of your week and thank you for joining us. Hope to thank see you, you all soon. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Dr. Raymond. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, guys.